Jane Patterson is a public speaking coach who transforms everyday speakers into confident and engaging communicators. She is originally from South Africa and moved to the United States with her husband and two young children. She came from Cape Town all the way to New Jersey and found herself in a situation where she couldn't work. Well, fast forward a few years and she became an etiquette coach and then started teaching more about how people can be better public speakers. She is passionate about traveling all around the world with her family and she is both a writer and a voracious reader. One of the things I love about my conversation with Jane is that she has never been shy about reinventing herself. She taught modern manners to 21st century teens, college students, and business professionals. She has education programs that focus on all aspects of etiquette that goes beyond table manners and business etiquette, but also covers teen dating, interview etiquette, and how to go out to dinner effectively as a professional. Through her company, One Perfect Speech, she helps people understand and comprehend the very real fear that so many people experience when they speak in front of groups of people. She believes that everyone has the ability to present a great speech if they are given the right coaching. Welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show, a podcast that helps you find fulfillment amidst chaos. On this show, I interview thought leaders, doctors, creatives, spiritual gurus, and game changers who inspire you to pursue your dreams, overcome obstacles, and leave your mark. Jane Patterson, welcome to the Lindsay Elmore Show. Thank you. Oh, it's so wonderful to speak with you today. One of the things I loved as I was researching you is that you believe that people can reinvent themselves as many times as you want. And you've done some reinvention of yourself. Tell us about your journey from South Africa to being an etiquette coach to coming to New Jersey and now being a speaking coach. Tell us how have you reinvented yourself? And I'm going to stop there. Just tell us that part first and then I'll probably have some follow-up questions about it. The journey sounds very planned and very organized, but for me, and I would think a lot of people, particularly women, it's almost an organic process. So I was born and raised in South Africa to Scottish parents. They were born and raised in Scotland and moved to South Africa in their twenties. So that originally, from the time I could draw breath, I realized you don't just have to end up where you started. My parents had cleared the table, completely moved. And in those days, that was a big deal, halfway around the world to the tip of Africa and created a wonderful life. So I think I maybe had that default setting that this is possible. This is not, you don't have to live with what you're given. I then went to university, which was a three hour plane ride away down in Cape Town. And again, the feeling that I didn't really want to study in Johannesburg, I wanted to be in Cape Town. So I went to Cape Town University, I studied there, did my postgrad there, met my wonderful husband there, and we lived there for 20 years. For many reasons, many, many reasons, after we had our second child, we decided that we wanted to try a life somewhere else. Now we were in our late 30s, so I'm not sure I advocate that for most people because it's very, very tough. We packed everything up, we left everything we knew, and we moved to New Jersey where we still reside. Now in Cape Town, I'd had a very particular life. I ran a media relations business. It was, I was super lucky. It was very, very successful. It was the right business at the right time with the right business partner. And again, I think I was just open to whatever the universe was going to bring. And again, I didn't sit down and drum this out and manufacture it. 
it just came to me. Just one day I was like, I want to do this. I'd been working at a newspaper. I had quite a head position at a newspaper in the promotions department. So I did it. And a lot of people were like, that's a big risk. You're leaving all this to go on your own. But it was almost a case of, if not now, when? I didn't have children. So we started the business very successful. As I say, we were so fortunate with just that little niche of timing. I had two children and we left. But when we came to America, we came on my husband's visa, which is what most people do. It's an H-1B visa. And you can't work. The spouse can't work. You've heard of goods and chattel. Well, the wife and family are the chattel. So you come along and you don't have a work permit anywhere. And I was a full-time mum. So I was just trying to figure out which side of the road to drive on. I certainly wasn't thinking, how am I going to replace this wonderful career and business I'd had in South Africa? It never entered my head. And I loved being a full-time mother. I was so shocked because I'd worked all the time when my children were born. I had an au pair, I had a nanny. I just couldn't believe the fact that I adored being a full-time mother. So I just fell into it. And then about eight years in, again, I found that I got that opportunity, people just asking me about an area I was knowledgeable in, I'd hate to say expert, that they wanted to know more about. And that was etiquette, which is just a fancy way of saying modern manners. So modern manners for the 20th century, why do we use modern manners? What are they there for? Are they rules? Are they guidelines? And I started to do a bit of research in the area very low key in my area and found out that nobody taught this it didn't exist as a business so i wasn't sure does it not exist because there's simply no demand or does it not exist and this is a giant opportunity to get in i took the approach that it was an opportunity to start it so i did i started teaching etiquette classes and to little kids you know, 9, 10, 11, basic table manners, your please, your thank you, holding doors, answering telephones, real basic stuff. But again, just through good fortune, people started bringing older children. And I was working with college kids and then business professionals. And it, it ramped up in such a natural way, I, I almost wasn't aware of what was happening. And someone once came to me and said well what is your business plan and what is it i was like oh i don't know i'm really just living this life as it goes along and for me as much as i'm a super organized super disciplined person just that letting go for a slight minute and thinking what's the worst that can happen if it doesn't work out i don't have to answer to a boss or a corporation or an organization so again i just stepped it through and it was going beautifully and I loved it and I felt so fortunate that I could do something that honestly I wouldn't have even worried if people didn't pay me because I loved it so much and then at the age of 15 my teenage son was diagnosed with cancer acute lymphoblastic leukemia mm. so everything stopped he's mm -hmm. fine everything 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 stops it's a four-year treatment for teenage boys you're in chemotherapy for four years horrendous it's it's the actual treatment is worse than the disease but we stepped through it and everything else stopped in my life and by the time he was out of treatment after the four years and he went to college i just couldn't go back to the business i pretty much wrapped it up naturally over four years i just didn't have the energy to give of myself anymore it had just been such a hard hard journey so i turned to writing which is something i always loved and one of my postgrads was in writing so i was like why not use this now so i actually started a book i self-published a book just a novel i started blogging i did a whole variety of different things and that kept me going during that time once our son was a lot better my husband suggested because i had done a lot of public speaking with the etiquette business you know leading classes leading groups going to clubs and offices and businesses his business he did a lot of public speaking and he said why don't we do one of these community courses you know like the community colleges that you get offered so we signed up for one of those and we loved it loved it loved it loved it so we took that and we just leveraged that and we joined toastmasters and again it was 
the universe just brought to me. It was the right thing at the right time. And I started to get more and more into it. I became president of our club. I got my CC and my CL in the first two years. They're like levels of uh, accomplishment. I'm a mentor. I was an advisor. I went to competitions. I bought into the whole thing and I loved it. It was su it is such a great organization. And then again, people started coming to me. I didn't hunt people down. A friend came to me and her husband actually, well, it was their daughter was getting married. And the husband wanted to give father of the bride's feet. And the wife, who was my friend, was mortified because she said to me, Jane, he can't speak. He's a dreadful public speaker. Can you somehow coach him, but in a very low key way? So, you know, he was game and it opened up that first door. And it, again, there's one thing led to the next, led to the next. And then I started, I'd always been um, a, a tutor as well, a writing tutor when I was doing my own writing. And some of those parents said, oh, you know, you're doing the speech side of it. My son wants to get into debate. My boy has to go for an interview, for an internship. And suddenly, again, this thing just built up and built up and built up and till it was a fully fledged business. But again, I can't, I admire those women who sit down and, you know, pick something and go right after it. And I, I've done that. I mean, I've built it up to be something, but I didn't, it all was just sort of slowly revealed to me for want of a better word. It just came naturally what I do. And I, the one thing I would always say, I am very fortunate in that I have the freedom that I can play around with these things and I can experiment with these things. And if they don't work out or it's not great, there's no, well, what are you going to do now? There's no pressure like that. So I am fortunate and I, I do, I count my, my blessings every single day, but that got me to where I am now. And it, none of it was perfectly planned. It all just unfolded. Where do you think the courage to take a chance, take a risk? I mean, it's no small feat to say, I'm going to move from South mm -hmm. Africa to New Jersey. It's no small feat to leave a high paying, lucrative yeah. job. It's no small feat to be a mom who has a child with cancer making extraordinarily difficult decisions and especially with a 15 year old who's going to have very strong opinions about their treatments where do you think that your ability to have the courage to start and i'm sure that you hit some bumps and bruises and things along the way what kept you going and what still keeps you going for me, it's based on relationships. I was very fortunate. I had amazing parents. I had a very stable, highly functional home life. You know, everything ran smoothly. We didn't want for much. We traveled all over the world. I had a really good foundation and a base in my home life. And on my first week of college, when I went to university, University of Cape Town, in that first week, I met my now husband and even at the age of 17 I knew as much as one knows at 17 I really thought this is someone I can see myself spending a lot of time for with when I look back on that I'm thinking how did I even assume that how arrogant of me how naive but it then became that I always had and have that incredible foundation very very strong boyfriend became fiance became husband and I was married very young and I was still doing my postgrad and that for me that relationship has always been my harbor in that I have the freedom to try things and face things that if it all bombs I've got someone who's got my back 24-7 Mm -hmm. As a mother, I have tried and I think I've succeeded. My children are 27 and 24 now that I have always, my husband and I are always that harbor, that safe place that we've got your back. We don't excuse everything. I'm a very strict mother, but I've got your back. It's unconditional 
that somebody is there for you. And I think having the privilege of that relationship would be the foundation. Mm -hmm. Then on top of that, I give full credit to the fact that I had so many educational opportunities. Uh, Everything I did, I was welcomed into. I was accepted. I didn't have to push back too much, which builds your confidence. And then you're not scared to try new things. And the more you do it, the more you embrace it. So uncertainty leaves all of us feeling off balance. That's that's what it is. We face uncertainty every single day in our lives. You can walk outside your front door, get hit by a bus. But we calculate the risk and we say, yeah, that's something I can deal with. So many people get hit by a bus. So, but we innately don't like uncertainty. The trick is the more you put yourself in that unsettled, caught on your back foot feeling, and you come through it and you come out the other side, you build a resilience that then allows you to do it again because you know you can do it. You tried it. I mean, we moved to this country, I knew not a single soul on this con- continent. And I figured it out. I, you just figure it out. I am a naturally confident person, but I'm also super organized. And when things start feeling slightly wobbly, my default setting is always get organized, get yourself organized, get a strong routine and set yourself short term goals. Mm -hmm. So when my son was first diagnosed, there's, there's nothing I have ever faced in my life and God willing, I'll never face it again. As the day they sit down and say, no, your son is not just sick. He's actually has cancer. Uh, the first things I did was go back to my routine. You know, I created a new routine for him, for me, you're in hospital every single day. I said, short-term goals, even if it's to the hour, within an hour, I will do this, or he will do this, or we will achieve this. And just set those yardsticks and keep, keep following through. Just be organized, stay on top of it. And it gives you a feeling of control, even when everything else was out of control. I had all my systems. I had everything in place. And I, I ran it almost like a small business because the moment you do that, you feel a little bit more in control. So probably my natural default setting as a person is that I can, I can handle change. Mm-hmm. I can deal with change. And I married someone who is extraordinarily good at change. So between the two of us, we just motor on and constantly if you're not changing i'm telling you you're going to just stay in one place no matter what your age is you have to keep adapting and evolving absolutely you you absolutely do and i think this year has been a banner year for change (laughs) and adopting new routines new challenges new all the things so i do want to talk about public speaking with you since that is a a big topic that you are currently working on. And most of the listeners on this show are either interested in health and wellness or interested in female entrepreneurship. Typically they're wanting entrepreneurial businesses related in some way to health and wellness. And so Public speaking is one of those things that people are terrified to do. It is anxiety inducing. It can be one of those things that people just say, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. And a lot of the advice that we get about public speaking, the whole like picture the audience naked, it's like that does not help in any way, shape or form. So why? Why, number one, let's take a step back. Why is public speaking so anxiety laden when really and truly, it seems like we as humans are very good at using verbal communications. Why do people get so nervous when it's in front of an audience? That for me, I never struggled with that. So I understand uh, in that I'm empathetic to people who feel great nervousness, but I never dwell on that. It doesn't matter whether you feel nervous or not. 
tons of people feel nervous, but you're starting off on the wrong footing. And there's several key things here I always address with clients when they come in for the first time. People say, I don't want to adopt or take on any form of public speaking because I'm so nervous and I'm so anxious. So in your life, are there other things that make you nervous or anxious and you don't do them? Absolute nonsense, of course they are. Constantly we do things that make us scared, but we embrace them. People go shark cage diving back in Cape Town where I come from. What is wrong with these people? It's terrifying. People do it. People have super long hair and cut it really short. People have children. I mean, nothing is braver than deciding to bring a child into the world. We don't not do it because it makes us anxious. We rationalize it to ourselves and say, this is something that's incredibly scary, but I really want to do it. So I'm going to do it. And the excitement is going to be amazing. So first of all, you can't, if you're going to go about your life and think, I'm not going to take public speaking on because it makes me so nervous. You're already in the wrong mindset. You have to say, I'm going to do it because this is something that's going to be exciting and is going to enhance my life and bring value to my life. So why did I go shark cage diving, whatever it's called? Because it gave me something to talk about. It was such a novel experience. So you, you remember that. You have to channel that when you come to public speaking. If you go in from the point of view that you're nervous and anxious, you're really going to struggle. So you have to reset your mind. And once you take that first step and say, no, this is something important, I'm going to master this or at least get better at it, you're over the first step. The second step I say to people is that you do not want the spotlight to swing to you when it's something that matters desperately to you but you haven't practiced the skill. So think about it. You never ever take swimming lessons. I'm not going to learn to swim. I don't like swimming. Swimming's horrible. Like my hair looks awful afterwards. So what's going to happen that one day when you fall out of the boat? You're going to think, gee, I kind of wish I'd done those old swimming lessons. So that's what I say about public speaking. And the, but people will come back to me and I'll say, but in my business, I don't have to speak in front of groups of people. I'm not giving wedding speeches. I don't raise my hand. I'm fine. I can live without ever doing any public speaking again. But can you? Because think about it. Even if you're a stay-at-home dad and, and you're just ticking over and you've got the greatest life, you're coaching sports and whatever, someone comes to the town and says, you know what, we're going to build a I don't know, nuclear power plant right next to the sports field. And you're thinking, I don't want this to happen. So how are you going to stand in front of your city council and advocate for your town? How are you going to inspire people? How are you going to create change if you're too nervous to stand up in front of a group of people to speak? So if you practice public speaking, I'm not saying, you know, you've got to become an orator of the year or a Toastmaster speaker of the year. I'm just saying if you can polish your own personal skills, having that knowledge empowers you in so many other situations. Studies show in business, women are so often overlooked, discounted, and dismissed because they don't speak up. I'm not talking about an entry-level intern or a young person right out of university. There have been studies that have shown even women in high-up positions in a board meeting or a group meeting their young assistant who's you know 20 years younger than them will speak over them will interrupt them why because the woman feels lack of confidence in her public speaking skills and if you learn the tricks and the techniques and the tips to good public speaking it can change so much of life dinner parties how many times have you been at dinner parties and someone raises a topic and you're thinking about the topic, you're marshalling your thoughts before you have an opportunity to open your mouth. Somebody's jumped in a man usually and is completely overriding you and voicing their opinion. It's that lack of confidence, that lack of belief in your public speaking skills that can hamper you. And as I say, it doesn't mean you're going to get in front of the, your alma mater and give the keynote address. I'm just talking about maybe sitting at book club or a wine group, you know, you need to be able to express yourself and effective public speaking carries you into all aspects of people's lives. And 
the thing I remind everybody, it is one of the quickest skills to pick up. And I mean that. Even as a coach who earns her money doing this, I taught writing for years. You can work with a student for five years, their writing will go up 10% improvement. I can sit with a client, student, anybody, and within the first hour, I can give them tips and techniques that will change their public speaking immediately and be usable from that very next Zoom call or that very next time they sit around and do a presentation. So it's, it's a great skill to learn, it really is. And the nerves, I have so many tricks and techniques and tools and ways that I will get you past those nerves that you will, it won't even be an issue for you. And then you'll raise your hand more. If you raise your hand more, you'll speak more. If you speak more, you're less nervous. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but you have to start somewhere. And that starts with believing in your skills, believing in yourself, and believing that what you have to say and what you have to convey is important. It's that simple. The thing I love most about what you just said is right. that speaking is a skill that right. you can learn, train yes. yourself, and yes. teach to someone else. It, it's almost like we think that the best orators in the world came by it naturally. People say it to me all the time, you're such a natural speaker. And I say, no, I'm a very highly trained <laughs> speaker. For the when I first started public speaking on bigger stages, audiences of a thousand to five thousand people, I remember back in those days using the Winston Churchill approach to speaking, which was for every one minute that I was on stage, I would prepare for mm -hmm. an hour, an hour. And Winston Churchill did it. Everybody talks about like how rousing his speeches are, how without Winston Churchill, World War II could have gone a completely different direction but he didn't just walk out there and say yeah. it. It was very highly rehearsed, very highly coordinated, mm -hmm. very much the, the word choice was with right. intention and with meaning. Yeah. So for all of our listeners who are wanting to grow their sphere of influence in health and wellness or start their own business, where do they begin to craft some of these skills? What are some of the skills that you start people with? They've decided their message matters and dang it, they want to be able to speak up at a city council meeting or they want to be able to go to somebody and say, hey, I've got this amazing product. Would you like to buy it? Right. What are the first steps to becoming a better speaker? For me, because I work one-on-one -on -one with clients and students, I always start off with an assessment because Toastmasters is a brilliant program, but it will take you through from A to Z. Not everybody comes in at the same level. So I always assess the student and I look at where they have areas for improvement and I look at what they're doing very well. So I can't directly answer your question about what is your basic first step because the first step for Mary might be completely different than the first step for Mario. For a lot of people, there is almost a basic check sheet of things we would go through. Break them down into verbal and nonverbal. But I would think if I, to answer your question, if I had to sum it up in a short, concise manner, I would say to people, the first thing you need to do is slow down. Most of us speak too quickly. We can get away with it when it's a chatty conversation, even an interview like this, we're speaking probably a little quicker because it's a, it's a chat-based format. But if you're going into, say you're a YouTuber or you're an influencer and you want to put something together, you need to slow down your rate of speed because people don't have all the cues that we have when we're with the person face-to-face. -face. So we can't really read a lot of 
their expressions, their body language, the energy they're giving off, the way they use their space, because we're trapped on these little screens. So I would say the first thing I would recommend is slow down, slow down and own the pause. So if you find yourself getting to a crutch word, you find a filler word, and that's anything along the lines of, um, you know, I mean, like, uh, any word that you repeat, that's just a crutch to move you to the next point. Hold your pause, have learned the confidence to just press your lips together, marshal your thoughts, figure out what you want to say, and then say it. So slowing down and owning the pause will immediately put you in a better mindset. For anybody, before you record anything or you're a wellness coach and you want to put out a, a you know, beautiful maybe set of classes or whatever, obviously I've got a million things I can tell you to do. But the key thing I would say is your cell phone is your biggest friend. Whatever you're going to put out there, record yourself on your cell phone and go back and evaluate yourself have a harsh eye on yourself and if you can rope somebody else in get someone else in your house to look through it with you because trust me as soon as it is they'll point out to you and say you know that's weird you keep doing that you keep doing this now we don't want to get to a point that we're so polished that it becomes inauthentic because any audience whether they're behind a camera or whether they're sitting with you in a room they will pick up that inauthenticity that fakeness humans are very finely calibrated to pick up things that are fake so don't get yourself to such a polished robotic point that people you're not you're not believable do your things that make you you because that's the one thing that nobody else in this world can copy they can copy your hair they can copy your tone of speech the pace but they can't copy you so you have to find your authentic you and learn how to convey that and the balance between being speaking slower and more thoughtful not falling back on filler words but still keeping that something that is you you'll find when you look at it on your cell phone screen and keep doing it and doing it until you get to a point where the whole 360 works for you and then you'll be ready to move forward Absolutely. I know that since we've been doing so much online mm -hmm. this year, one of the things I've noticed is my hair kind of drives me crazy. Oh, me too. Yeah. And, and so I'll constantly just be like, like yeah. this. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. okay, but no, it's not smoothed out. It's not this. No. And then I realized, just stop doing no. that. Yeah. No yeah. one notices except for me. Yeah. Exactly. Nobody notices. Yeah. Yeah. You offer consultations for anyone who is interested in improving their public speaking skills. You work with interview skills in improving presentations, working on virtual speaking skills, which goodness knows we've all yeah. been getting better at that. And right. you can find out more listeners by heading to oneperfectspeech.com. That's O-N-E, oneperfectspeech.com. What would be your biggest tips for online speaking? If people are very used to being in person, especially anybody, you know, we have so many people in this country, adults and children with Asperger's and being on the autism spectrum where they're very much dependent on cues, visual cues and understanding body language, how can we give better presentations online? Because goodness knows you can zone out in a virtual session infinitely faster than right. you will zone out in a live presentation. What do we do to not only become better speakers, but also become better listeners yes. in this online format? Yes, yes. Oh my goodness, Lindsay, I could stand up and give you a three hour lecture on just this. It is a whole new field for so many people. So let me try to bring it down to certain quick usable points so that we're not here for Christmas. 
the first thing I would say for me is try to imitate, emulate the sort of setting and view that you would have if it had been the real world. So when I work with interview students, the first thing I say to them is you're going into an interview situation. I want you to picture what it would have been like if you had been sitting across the desk from the person who's going to interview you. Would you be looking down on them? No, you wouldn't. Would you be slouching? No, you wouldn't. Would you be wearing PJ pants? No, you wouldn't. So you need to set yourself up as though you're speaking to another live human being. For me, it's a case of I like to get the camera height up a little bit. So I'm looking eye level. Immediately, that makes the person's chin become parallel to the floor. So they're less likely to mumble or talk down stairs like this. It also tends to open up your vocal cords, as you know, and makes the tone of your voice a lot better. And it helps you keep a decent posture because you're looking eye level. You're not looking hunched over like that. So for me, eye level is the key thing. If, if you're not, you're experienced. I mean, you could do this and look beautiful regardless. But if you're new to this game, the moment you lift it up, you'll feel more normal as though you're sitting in a coffee shop, you know, a restaurant, having an interview at somebody's desk or across a boardroom table. The other thing I think you need to do is train yourself to look into the camera. It is brutal. It is the most unnatural, awkward, horrible thing, but it makes a big difference. Don't think you need to man eye contact with the camera the entire time because that's going to be weird as well you can look down you can look at the other people on the screen but you need to go for about 60 or 70 percent time that you're making eye contact with the camera lens and this depends what what format you're on i'm on a freestanding video camera so i have to make sure to look straight at it that will immediately put you in a different sphere than the nose cam Please be aware of your background. Try to keep it as simple, as unfussy as possible. Because if you have a very detailed background, I'm terrible. I watch TV. They interview these people standing in front of 10,000 books. I will spend most of the interview trying to work out what are the books on their shelves? What is that title? Should I have read that? So don't do it. Go for something that people will might look at once and go, oh, a vase on a shelf and then they'll never look at it again. You can do the blank wall if that works for you. So immediately you're trying to recreate the scene of what it was before, a natural setting, but you're trying to distract them from everything apart from you. When we were in the live setting world, the person you were speaking to kept your attention because they were the bright, shiny object. They moved, they spoke, they shifted around, they had vocal intonation, whatever. That is all taken away on a 2D format. Everything becomes flat. So the book on the shelf is almost as important as the person's face. So you do not want your face to not be the focus. I also say, and this is very controversial, but I also say try, if at all possible, to limit your use of slides. Now, I know in business settings, there are people tearing their hair out at me. And I have done longer presentations where I've had a slight split screen and a slide here and there. But if you want to lose the attention of your listeners, I vote you just stick up a, a slide because people will look at the slide. They'll take in the information. I guarantee they're turning around, they're playing on the phone, they're watching their TV, they're fixing their, they are doing a million things. You are the bright, shiny object. Don't ever forget that. And as long as you're on screen, people will be drawn to watching you. The moment you replace it with a piece of printed paper, you've lost them. Then you're going to have to work twice as hard when you next pop up on screen because another person's looking at the side deciding whether they should paint that wall blue now. So you don't do anything that can in any way derail your listener. Now, I can't get into practicing and lighting and all those things, but if you start with that and just remember you are the person on the screen, I think you're going to go a long way toward it. Be authentic, be yourself, and 
I think you will connect with your audience, but you have to be the person holding the attention. And if you're not experienced, the best thing when you start posting your YouTubes, your little Instagram posts, your live, whatever, keep them short, keep them short and, and learn to build yourself up, learn to get the stamina to keep speaking naturally for a period of time. But if you can lose the slides or minimize the slides, you're going to be halfway home. I remember back when I was a professor, we got a lecture from a, some organization named them Educator of the Year. Okay. And he comes in and he puts up his first slide and it's about four words, all written in black, all written in Calibri font and on white. And he says the biggest mistake that educators make is by trying to make their slides cute. And so you've got these things that are jumping up and down and you've got this, this over here. And he says, all that does is make people stop listening to you. People stop listening because they're like, oh, there's a bouncing object over there. And he encouraged no photos on slides. He's like, if you have to use slides, they're black, they're white. The average person puts about 40 words on a PowerPoint slide. The average TED Talk has four words per slide because if someone is reading their slides, they're not listening to you. Okay. And Back when I was on a lot of stages all around the world, I would fuss at people constantly because I would put up a slide and all of a sudden here comes the phones and they're taking a photo and then the phone yeah, goes down. Yeah, yeah. And I exactly. tell and I tell people, number one, no one goes back and looks at photos of old exactly. slides. No, you don't yeah. sit and like study those slides. You, no one does it. People swear they do. And I'm like, mm -hmm. how much time did you actually put towards those slides? Yeah. And yeah. the other thing is, if you're taking a photo of my slide, number one, you're not listening to me. Great. Number two, you're not engaging mm -hmm. your brain. Yeah. Yeah. in a way that will help you to remember what I'm saying. Your brain is very well wired if you have a pen and a piece of paper and you are writing notes. Your brain yes. is terrible if you're trying to take notes on your phone. It doesn't work the same. And so I would just, I would almost dare audiences mm -hmm. not to pick up your phone for the entire 45 minutes that I'm speaking. And if you really want to go to the next level, get out a pen yeah. and a piece of paper and write down notes. I think another way that people utterly fail at public speaking is they vastly overestimate the power of the human attention span. Mm -hmm. And so I will get invited and they're like, okay, well, we want you to give an hour and a half long presentation. I'm like, nope, not doing it. Not going to do it. I'm abs, my absolute hard stop is 45 minutes. Yeah, I would exactly. rather speak for 15 minutes than for 45. Yeah. Because if yeah. I can't say it in 15 minutes, I can't yeah. say it yeah. in 45. So what are some, just, you know, as we wrap up, what are some of your pet peeves that you see audience members as well as speakers doing? Because I can tell you as a professional speaker, Sometimes the audience, you just want to wring their neck because it's like, I, I worked hard to be here prepared to say this and now you're not listening. So what are some other pet peeves that you see that could, you know, perhaps get, what is our etiquette? What is speaker etiquette and what is audience member etiquette? Going back to your former life as an etiquette teacher. There we go. So with Let's flip it and say, as you said, start with the audience, how the audience should behave. It all comes back to just basic good manners and thinking about how would you like to be treated if you were up there? So for me, 
And if you speak enough, you are able to tune this out. Even though you might be steaming, you, you can keep going. You know, you'll focus on the people who are paying attention. Or if it's a really huge audience, you just keep going with your message. Maybe try to tailor it in certain ways. But for me, it's people who talk among themselves. That drives me nuts. Because in my very, very early lives, I trained as a teacher. And if you were in my class and you even said one word, I would just freeze you out with a look. And I have to be careful not to do that with grown adults in smaller <laughs> settings. You know, I want to be teacher and, you know, sort of glare at you. People speaking amongst themselves, people on their cell phones. I have had to become a little more lenient about that. But I always say, if I am sharing a lot of information science, I always have a download. I will you know, circulate things afterwards. You can reach out to me personally. There's a million ways. I'm not, this is not a memory test. You don't have to sit there and then in hour's time, I'm going to call you back and ask questions. So I just want you to sit and be in the moment and absorb the information that's important to you. If it becomes very technical or very detailed, or you're getting into the minutiae of something, and certain fields require that, you should always have some sort of handout, download. You should have a way the person can get to that information. Because, and if you state that up front, the pressure is off them. They're like, oh, phew, I don't have to remember 3% of this and 6% of that. I'm going to get that information afterwards that I will go over at my leisure. They then step calm down a bit and they're like, just listen, just let me listen. This is not meant to be, uh, you know, some sort of death march. It's meant to be something where you learn and you're open to gaining knowledge. So people who talk about themselves, people who futz around on their phones and things like that, it's very distracting, particularly for more inexperienced speakers because your eye keeps getting drawn back to somebody bobbing and weaving around. If you need to get up and leave the room, gosh, it had better be for an emergency. Really, your house needs to be on fire because to stand up and walk out of a room while somebody is speaking, I think is really, really unfortunate to the, to the speaker. And it's dreadfully distracting to the people who are actually trying to listen. I'm also, and, and it would depend on the informality of the presentation speech. I'm a big one for keeping questions to the end. I was in a presentation the other day yesterday i was not presenting i was participating and the person was two-thirds away with her presentation very interesting very well put together and one of the people in the zoom group interrupted her and said oh may i just add to that point you know i agree with i was like no you seem to misunderstand this is not a conversation so if you can say to people any questions queries concerns thoughts whatever it is Let's hold on them to the end. I think that makes a difference. So as an audience, you need to behave like a decent human being and respect <laughs> the person who's up there. You know, don't speak amongst yourselves. Don't do things that are distracting. From in the audience watching a speaker, my pet peeve is the pacer. You know, the tiger in the cage chap who walks up and down and up and down because somebody at some point told him this is him owning his space. This is him casting an important big shadow. No, it's dreadful. It's absolutely dreadful. I'm very much in favor of you moving around. It is very difficult just to stand dead still. And for many people, it's not natural. I'm not someone who would just stand like a statue and give my presentation. I like to walk a bit. I might come to the front. It keeps people engaged but avoid the pacing up and down. And the things we all know, you know, include vocal variety in the way you speak. Anybody who just speaks in the same monotone, eventually you're going to just stop listening. We all know those things. So for me, the, the pet peeve has to be the pacer. And I also don't like people who, and this sounds mean, but I don't like people who go for the cheap applause. So, you know, don't come on and be like, hi there, New York, or something, just to get everybody to start clapping. I know that sounds silly, but I just think, you know, you're not a stand-up comedian, don't, don't do that. And when you come on and it is your time to start speaking, you can thank the person, you know, thank you, Mary, for that introduction if, if that's what you want to do but do make sure you never never 
open with an apology. Never start and say, guys, you know, I'm no public speaker or I'm not really an expert on this or don't start on any sort of negative apology. Even if it's something out of your hands, don't say, you know, I'm really sorry that the band is so loud or whatever. You need to have dealt with that beforehand. And if it is something that is a concern, you need to then get your speech started and then just say very quietly, I'm aware of the noise. I have someone dealing with it and move on. Don't stand up and start with the hand wringing. It turns people off. Get up, start your message, have a good hook, get started and keep moving forward. The moment you start the woe is me stuff, people stop listening. Absolutely. Such amazing tips, tricks <laughs> on becoming a better speaker. Everyone, please go and check out www.oneperfectspeech.com. You can also reach out to Jane directly over at www.janepeterson.com. Everybody, Patterson. take Patterson. and Patterson. Pat I'm sorry, Patterson. I can't Patterson. read. One T. Patterson, Patterson with one T. Oh, well, you know what? I won't lead with an apology. I'll just say, go yeah. and check out janepatterson.com with one T and please take advantage. Everyone has it in them to become a better speaker. Thank you so much for being on the Lindsay Elmore show. Thank you so much. Do you have big dreams, but are unsure how to put them into action? Brand Strategies Lab is the place to turn your ideas into the nuts and bolts that you need to create, revitalize, or expand your brand. It is an online business training course that helps you decide who you are, what you sell, and who will buy it. It is hosted on a brand new social media platform called Channels. If you love Marco Polo, video chatting with your friends, or Snapchat, then you will absolutely love Channels. I created Brand Strategies Lab following more than 10 years of business coaching, mentorship, reading, and personal growth. Find out more and be the first to access this new training at www.lindsayelmore.com bsl. That's www.lindsayelmore.com slash B-S-L. The Lindsay Elmore Show is written and produced by me, Lindsay Elmore. Show segments are produced by Sue Procco and Kelsey Lorman. Production design, sound design, and editing is by Jive Media. If you have a question about this or any other episode of the podcast, send us an email to hello at lindsayelmoreshow.com. And hey, since you're still here, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And while you're at it, go over and follow us on Instagram, at Lindsay Elmore Show. This helps us bring the pod to more people.